Hello, welcome to this online symposium of Hillsdale College. Thank you for joining us. Uh, report from the college. Uh, we're restricted here, but thriving. Uh, we can go to Home Depot and buy shovels and garden hose, but we can't buy seeds because that would spread the virus. And uh, we can go out in kayaks and canoes, but boats with motors are forbidden. And that means there's somebody in the governor's office making lists of things that we can do and not do. And I don't know who that person is, but I'll bet a lot of money that person knows nearly nothing about the coronavirus. Uh, he's a governor's office person, I imagine. Um, so, uh, they have not forbidden thinking and talking, and that's what we do for a living. So we have lots of conferences, like this online conference every year. You're invited. We have them on the campus four times a year. Uh, but uh, we're going to do this virtually and uh, until and unless they forbid thinking and talking, which would not astonish me. Um, what are we talking about and thinking about? Well, the coronavirus, that's what everybody's thinking about. And uh, we want to try to understand the virus, and we're going to look at its origins in this first session with the person who discovered the origins. And then we're going to look at uh, uh, economic effects of the virus and the shutdown, and we're going to look at the epidemiological studies and how they're changing and uh, whether or not it was predictable that they would change. Somebody asserts that, th that it is. So we're going to have a thorough look at all this and uh, try to figure out how we can get back to freedom as soon as possible. Uh, the first guest is a member of the United States Senate. Uh, he's from Arkansas, as am I. Uh, the joke that we would be cousins is not true, but we have been friends for a long time. Got to be 20 years now. Uh, he's a very serious man. He uh, grew up on a farm in Dartnell, Arkansas. He ended up at Harvard College and then Harvard Law School. And then he consulted for a while and he joined a law firm and, uh, in Washington and he was about to start making some, enough money to support himself. I know all about this because I know his sister is also a lawyer and does his taxes and she said, yeah, just when he got to a place where he could make some money, he up and joined the army. He did that after 9-11 because we'd been attacked and he thought he should go assail the people who had attacked us and he did in Iraq and then again in Afghanistan, won a Bronze Star. And then he got out and he was again in a great position to make a, make a big income, but he ran for Congress. And then the next term he ran for Senate and he was elected to both by large majorities. And uh, I will tell you, he's a very significant man. It's a big future for us in the country. And uh, how did you get into this, Tom? Tell us about that. How did it start? What's the story there? Well, it was back in early, mid-January, Larry, uh, that I first began to see news coming out of mostly publicly available, if somewhat obscure, news sources in East Asia about a viral pneumonia of unknown origins in Wuhan. Um, this was after China had finally fessed up to the WHO on December 31st, but still when they were denying that it could transmit from humans to humans, and they were saying that they had things under control, there was no cause for alarm, no reason to declare a global health emergency or impose travel restrictions. Um, but I began to look at what they were doing internally. They were shutting down schools nationwide, not just in Wuhan. They were literally welding or boarding up doors on high-rise apartment buildings in Wuhan. They allowed the puppet government in Hong Kong to shut down air travel from the mainland into Hong Kong. The disconnect between their rhetoric and their actions is what told me that Beijing knew that this virus was very severe and that we should start preparing for it immediately. So you may recall back in mid to late January, the impeachment trial was going on in Washington. Um, but on several occasions, I stepped out of the trial to make phone calls to the president or other senior administration officials to discuss the virus and discuss steps that we should be taking that started with the restrictions on air travel from China into the United States. Um, but that was what really brought my attention first to the matter in mid-January, the contrast between Chinese communist rhetoric on the one hand and their actions on the other hand. Hmm. And uh, what reaction did you get from those first announcements? Um, so many people, as you might imagine, considered it alarmist. They thought that perhaps it was trying to distract away 
from the impeachment trial. I remember the first briefing that the Senate had uh, in late January with all the reporters congregated outside the room. Of course, almost every question coming out of that briefing to senators was about impeachment, not about the coronavirus. But as I said, in a armed services committee hearing, not on the Senate floor, which of course was locked up by the trial, that this was the biggest story in the world and probably would be for some time. Um, but certainly the media didn't think so at the time. The president uh, was concerned about the virus from the very beginning. Uh, that's why he imposed those travel restrictions, things for which he was decried as racist, xenophobic, hysterical, which the WHO condemned, which China condemned, which many Democrats condemned. Um, but we now know bought us lots of very valuable time. Of course, within his administration, there was a division of opinion. Um, many in the security area uh, recognized just how severe the virus could be, like me. Um, others were concerned about the economic impact, and that's understandable, as was the president, um, because he sits at the peak of the government. He has to consider all those factors, and something Dr. Fauci has said since then, that he gives public health advice, but that can't be the only advice on which an elected president in the Congress makes decisions. Uh, but ultimately, the president, despite that division of opinion, uh, move forward with the travel restrictions. Um, and then as time went on, I think more and more of the senior administration officials, just like senators and congressmen, just like the American people, began to realize the severity of the virus um, and the risk probably outweighed the short-term economic impact of things like the travel restrictions on China or travel restrictions on Europe. Some of those concerns now in retrospect seem quaint given the catastrophic economic toll this virus has taken on our economy as a whole and really the global economy as a whole. Well, the uh, always reliable New York Times has written of you in this context that you are one of the most irresponsible and dangerous people in federal office. And the Washington Post, <laughs> isn't that great? It's, a, it's like a, getting a medal from the military, which you've had. Uh, Washington Post, Tom Cotton keeps repeating a coronavirus conspiracy theory that was already debunked. Isn't that funny? Yeah, uh, so that goes back a couple months um, in late February, really in, in early January, I first started um, pointing out that uh, we knew from really mid-January that the so-called wet market, the food market in Wuhan where you could buy live or recently slaughtered animals, including many exotic animals, was not the source of this virus. That is a Chinese cover story. Um, how do we know that? Um, one, the best evidence we have is that the kind of bats uh, or other animals from which this virus is believed to have jumped to humans weren't even present in the market. Two, a study of Chinese scientists, not Western scientists, but Chinese scientists who are under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party, nevertheless was released in January in the Lancet, uh, respected medical journal that said of the first 40 cases, 14 had no contact at all with the uh, food market, including the very first case that they could identify. As one of them put it, that virus went into the market before it came out of the market. So therefore, I, I simply started raising the point that there are two virology labs in the uh, vicinity of that food market. One's just a few hundred yards away, um, one's a couple or about eight miles away. And we know they research coronaviruses. We know they have bats present. We now know that U.S. diplomats in China were very worried about their safety levels and that surely it was only the responsible thing to do given the fact that China had lied about the food market being the original site of the outbreak to ask the question and demand China's answers. Of course, they're not giving those answers. They're still intimidating anyone who tries to cooperate with a probe of that matter. They're just uh, destroying evidence as they have from the very beginning. So I now believe, as I wrote in the Wall Street Journal last week, that the most plausible explanation is there was an accidental breach of research uh, conducted in one of those laboratories, and that accidental breach unleashed this pandemic on the world. We may never know for sure. Uh, there's no direct or conclusive evidence. Intelligence rarely works in that way. But all of the circumstantial evidence at this point uh, leads in one direction, and that's to one of those two labs in Wuhan. Now, the head of the World Health Organization has congratulated China repeatedly on its transparency. What about that? Well, the head of the World Health Organization is a Chinese communist apologist. Dr. Tedros was a minister in Ethiopia's government years ago when Ethiopia became one of the first clients of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which quickly brings with it corruption, bribes, kickbacks, and so forth. 
China aggressively campaigned for him in 2017 to become the head of the WHO. And from the very beginning, in January, Dr. Tedros has been apologizing for China. He's been spinning China's cooperation, which is really a lack of cooperation. He's been castigating national leaders like President Trump or European leaders for imposing any kind of travel restrictions on China at the outset of this, um, or pointing out that the most plausible ex explanation for this virus's origins is in one of those labs. And just recently, when China increased the number of reported deaths in Wuhan, um, even though it's still vastly underreporting them, of course, the WHO is out there with organized talking points and spinning in favor of Chinese transparency and responsibility and all of the great wonders of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, that's why there's really no way that we can trust what Dr. Chedro says, especially when it comes to what are ultimately political questions about the Chinese government, not scientific questions about this virus. Uh, I take it you uh, support President Trump def defunding the World Health Organization? Very much so, until we can have responsible and accountable leadership there that is not an apologist for the Chinese Communist Party, which, remember, pays a fraction of what the United States pays. So you can reasonably ask why they are so sympathetic to Chinese interests. So it's time for the WHO both to have an accounting of what they did in the early days of this virus and continue to do, and also commit to more accountable, transparent reforms in the future. If not, then the United States needs to take the lead with other leading democracies around the world and establishing an organization that will actually be dedicated to world health, not world politics. Um, what, um, we, we get a lot of the stuff we need for this pandemic and similar things from China. What about that? Yeah, that's a terrible mistake that our leaders have made over the last 30 years. We're beginning to see that so much of the stuff that we need to make, the physical things, not letters and words that move around on computers and wires, but the stuff that we need, like face masks and gloves and gowns and drugs, have to be made, at least in part, if not in whole, in the United States. Just like we treat our defense industrial base, we ought to have treated things like our pharmaceutical industry or personal protective equipment and so forth. Um, so it's a simple fact that China supplies much of these goods, not just the United States, but to the rest of the developed world. And they are currently using that fact as leverage against the United States and lots of our partners and allies around the world. That's why it's urgent that we reverse those decisions of the last 30 years. I know some people say you can't uh, decouple our economy from China. It's irreversible. It um, can't be done at, co at a reasonable price. I say that's false. This is the result of deliberate policy decisions in Washington over the last 30 years. It can be the result of different deliberate policy decisions in the coming months and the years ahead. And the fact is, although we get the predominant share of such equipment from China, it's not exclusive to China, nor is it exclusive to developing countries either. Much of our pharmaceuticals, for instance, come from advanced industrial democracies like Japan, Italy, Austria, Denmark. If they're producing it right now, there's no reason that we can't produce it in the United States as well at a reasonable cost. And I think most Americans, having seen the results of this pandemic, are saying that they'd be able, willing to pay a little bit more for things like their drugs or face masks or other medical devices and supplies if it means that no country can ever threaten our safety and well-being in the future. I, uh, uh, I'm a free trader myself. Uh, Winston Churchill was, but I'm aware that Abraham Lincoln was not, and uh, that means it doesn't seem to me like a precept of the natural law. I once talked with a, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, I won't say his name because I admire him so much, but he said uh, it would be better, even if somebody's engaged in predatory dumping economically, from the point of view of the whole world and us, to let them keep doing it. And I replied, okay, what if they got better at making and cheaper at making nuclear submarines than we do? Should we let them make those? And he replied, good point. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Larry. It's one thing for China to make uh, you know, cheap plastic toys or lawn chairs. It's another thing for them to make dozens of the advanced pharmaceutical ingredients that end up in our finished drugs in the United States or to have the global market cornered on things as basic as ibuprofen or acetaminophen penicillin or antibiotics. We have 
always known that we have to maintain our defense industrial base. I think increasingly now the eyes uh, in Washington are finally open to the fact that we have to do that in our pharmaceutical and our manuf medical manufacturing base, as well as other critical industries as well, like telecommunications, information technology, computer science, and so forth. And unfortunately, that's not just a matter for China either, although that's the most serious and gravest uh, country because they're an enemy and they have the market cornered in so many of those goods. But in a pandemic, where we've seen over the last three months, as we've seen throughout history, there really are not many allies and partners who you can trust to send the equipment and the drugs that you need in a moment of need if they have equal need. That's why it's so important that at least some, if not all, of this manufacturing capacity be based in the United States, not even in allied countries. Mm. Um, you say they're using leverage. Can you talk about in what way they do that? Sure. So in January, when they were still lying about the severity of this virus, they were actually buying up a lot of personal protective equipment. Not only were they making it, but they were also buying it from other countries that do, to not only for their own people, but ultimately to hoard as well. They've now been demanding that countries who receive these goods, you know, issue laudatory statements or favorable uh, social media posts that senior leaders, if not the senior leader, prime ministers of country, greet the deliveries at the airports when they're coming in, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of this equipment is turning out to be defective or shoddy. They're delaying uh, the export of a lot of American-owned products in, Amer in China, things that are owned by countries like 3M or smaller pharmaceutical companies that we know live up to American standards because they're American-owned on the grounds that they need to have quality control. Well, that's not really a concern of the Chinese government in most cases. What they're doing there, that is to try to get leverage over the United States government to not investigate the origins of this virus, to not call out Chinese lies and misbehavior. Um, they're doing it all around the world, and they're going to continue to do it as long as we give them that kind of leverage against us. I, uh, not long after we moved to Hillsdale, I uh, took my wife and family over to Chicago so they could see traffic, which they were missing. And uh, we went to the Field Museum, and there was an, a display of, the, uh, of Chinese treasures from the great dynasties. And uh, in the biggest room, there was a big poster, and it uh, thanked the Chinese government for their humanitarianism in making these treasures available to the world. And it was sort of sycophantic. But it was sitting, it was, it was on the wall right next to a mural of the emperor coming into a village. And everyone in the village had his forehead on the ground in this mural. And I thought, I wrote a letter to the director and he didn't write back. And I said, you know, did you ever contrast that statement with that mural? Isn't that, what, isn't that how they live? You know, if the government said, I mean, they welded people into their rooms, for goodness sakes. And, uh, that, you know, that'll keep them from getting out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, um, what, do, what do you think of larger Chinese ambitions? What are they up to? Well, they want to achieve global preeminence over the United States, and they want to use that preeminence, economic, diplomatic, political, financial, uh, military, to rewrite the international rules um, in their favor, you know, to take away an emphasis on democracy, on respect for the rights of man, um, on playing by the rules that we've established in the international order since 1945. Um, they do that in a lot of different ways. They do it through their Belt and Road Initiative and the money and the corruption that brings along with it. They bring it through rank intimidation, especially on their own uh, country's borders, through disinformation and propaganda campaigns, as was recently reported they've engaged in related to the virus. Um, so there's no end to the ways that China is attempting to replace the United States as the globally preeminent power. Um, they obviously don't want a military conflict with the United States because they know that they would lose, at least they would lose for the time being, but they have a deliberate, long-standing plan that's only been accelerated under Xi Jinping and that he is actually trying to use this pandemic to accelerate even faster. But it is well, well coordinated, considered, takes the long view, and looks in the decades ahead 
to replace the United States as the dominant power in the world that therefore gets to call the shots in the way the world is run. A couple of years ago, there was a, a meeting of the Chinese Communist Party, and uh, Xi gave a four-hour speech in which he proclaimed himself whatever he is for life. And uh, the New York Times report uh, explains that there were spontaneous eruptions of dancing and waving posters in joy at his four-hour speech. And I thought when I read that, that guy must be a really good talker. <laughs> Sounds like the spirit of Walter Durante still reigns at the New York Times. <laughs> Isn't that something? I mean, that's, uh, you know, Leonid Brezhnev used to give uh, four- and five-hour speeches to the Duma, and uh, everybody pretended to be interested. Yeah, and look, but look at that sycophantic reporting got the New York Times, Larry, along with the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. China kicked out their reporters uh, from uh, mainland China just last month, probably because they didn't want anyone snooping around into how this virus originated or what the actual uh, reported numbers were in China uh, and what, how China was exploiting the pandemic uh, to try to achieve its goal of global preeminence. Um, what, what should we, first of all, it's going to, China's going to be a big issue in the election. There's still an election this year, and it's still of the first importance. Um, how's ch the China issue going to play? How, how do you think the president has done in regard to China, and what's, what are going to be the attacks on him? Well, go back to the last election. Um, China was a central issue in that campaign as well. If you look at some of the things that set the president apart from what you might call more orthodox or conventional Republicans who are running against him. His views on things like foreign policy and uh, trade. Um, obviously, Hillary Clinton was a badly flawed candidate when it came to China. Joe Biden, though, is even more flawed, been around Washington even longer, been one of the central um, proponents of the idea that somehow if we introduced capitalism into China, it would change China, whether China as opposed to China changing capitalism, much for the worse. So Joe Biden has a long and very poor record on China in particular. Um, and I do think it will be a central issue in the campaign. Um, well before this pandemic, of course, Americans had all kinds of reasons um, to be hostile towards China, from stealing our jobs and our factories to stealing our intellectual property, like rice farmers in Arkansas know they stole the rice genomes. Uh, to persecuting Christians or other religious minorities, put, locking them up in gulag re-education camps, forcing abortion on their women, harvesting organs of political prisoners, threatening our partners and allies in the region and therefore risking conflict with our troopers. There's lots of reasons before this pandemic for people to have been critical of China and to oppose American political candidates who were sympathetic to China. But after this pandemic, of course, there's even more reason to do so. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I used to work with a man named Stephen Mosher, who's a great uh, China expert. He's the man who discovered the forced abortions in a Chinese village. He was the first Western scholar to get to go study in one. And uh, he wrote a paper, and I remember it distinctly. It was about the time that Li Pong became the head guy. And he said that uh, it's a new generation now. And what they are is Western-trained engineers. And what they think they're going to do is engineer the entire society and that they can make it great because they can bring scientific principles to rule. So that's not exactly orthodox Marxist-Leninism. But on the other hand, they probably learned that in Western universities and there are probably a lot of people in America, including in high places in government, who look, and think and look at that and think, yeah, that's the future. Yeah, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of Chinese students in our universities who are here to learn about advanced science, math, technology, engineering, and then go back and put it to use for the Chinese Communist Party. As you say, it's not exactly orthodox Marxism-Leninism, but it is authoritarian, and it's creeping towards totalitarian when you consider the vast social controls that Beijing exerts over its people. Uh, I have to say that's another area where we have to take stock of our relationship with China, the hundreds of thousands of students who are in this country, um, at a minimum saying that they're not allowed to study in those advanced scientific and technological fields at the graduate or postgraduate level. You know, 
what they should do is get a program like Hillsdale offers. You know, we should admit Chinese students to come here if they want to study Aristotle and the Bible and the Federalist Papers and Abraham Lincoln. But if they want to study quantum computing, then they can stay in mainland China for that. Because China, mm -hmm. China, China needs the Federalist Papers a lot more than they need quantum computing. There you go. I uh, can confide that, um, I won't say the woman's name, but there's a leader, a certain leader in Hong Kong, and I have offered to scholar scholarships to young people who might be excluded from Chinese universities because of their activities during the demonstrations. And uh, I think I'm going to get some names from her. And, uh, you know, they are very interested. She is very interested in how you build a political system that has strength and stability and freedom. And, you know, we are, we wrote the book about that. We're the ones who can do that, although we got to keep it still. Um, so, to, uh, what do we do? I mean, uh, what, what, what are the right range of policies to, to meet the Chinese threat? They, they have to be a wide range, right? Yeah, the, they are extremely wide ranging because the Chinese threat is so wide ranging. Uh, of course, in the end, the, the simplest question about international politics is if there's a war, who's going to win it? Um, and there's no doubt that right now the United States remains the strongest military power in the world. But there's also no doubt that for 30 years, China has had the ambition to displace us as the strongest military power. That's why it's so important that we continue to invest in and modernize our nuclear deterrent forces, that we build out next generation stealth fighters and bombers, uh, next generation submarines, that we rapidly produce the kind of inter intermediate range missiles that we were prohibited by a defunct obsolete treaty from building until President Trump withdrew from it uh, a few months ago. All these things we need urgently to deter Chinese aggression against our allies, against our partners in the Western Pacific, and ultimately to push us out of the Western Pacific. And we need those things not because we want to use them, but precisely because we never want to have to use them. We never want to be in a position where China feels that it can challenge us militarily. But that's only the most fundamental part of international politics. There's a whole host of things that we should do to advance our interests and to stop China from trying to establish itself as the preeminent power. So for instance, bringing back a lot of that manufacturing capacity to the United States, or at least trading with our partners, not our enemies. We never did that with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. We shouldn't be doing it with China now. That export-driven manufacturing economy is what has powered China's rise. So simply taking that away from China would be a grievous blow to them. There's a lot of other steps we can take as well. For instance, allowing American courts, despite traditional doctrines of sovereign immunity, to hear cases against Chinese leaders for unleashing this pandemic on the world, imposing sanctions on Chinese leaders who we know lied about this pandemic and dramatically, dramatically increased its severity. Canceling all those visas for Chinese Communist Party offspring who are sitting around our most advanced laboratories learning about some of the world's most sophisticated and advanced science as well. Countering Chinese disinformation. Even in Hollywood, where you may have noticed there's hardly ever a bad guy uh, coming from China. Or in our major newspapers, where the Chinese Communist Party repeatedly runs glossy uh, inserts that are designed to look like news, but are really Chinese Communist propaganda. Uh, these are just a few steps that we can take. There's a lot more, uh, but it has to be focused and deliberate and has to be well planned for years ahead to ensure that the United States remains what we have been for so long, the preeminent global power and a model for the way other countries can be governed and can live in freedom with prosperity and safety. Hmm. I uh, have uh, learned something of late that leads to a general suspicion. What I've learned about is a few cases where College presidents I know were out campaigning for foreign students in foreign countries. And I, uh, a couple of them I know I'm friendly with, and I said, why, why are you doing that? And uh, the reply was, they pay full tuition. And you know, tuition is very high. It's not at Hillsdale, but most places it's very high. And nobody pays it. But I, I, th I suspect, I don't know, I'm gonna try to find out, that the Chinese government is, is giving in, uh, was giving our universities a big cadre of full tuition payers 
who are also very smart. They're very smart people. And so there's some, uh, you know, it's government money of a different kind. And uh, I think we should, I agree with you, we should disrupt that. Yeah, well, so, you, don't, you don't have to investigate, Larry. I can tell you that is the case. It um, is? That for many colleges, um, especially in their science and technology fields, um, they actively recruit Chinese students, uh, other foreign nationals as well, but Chinese students in particular, because they pull f pay full freight. They don't take a dollar of scholarship money or need-based financial aid. Um, and in many, if not most cases, those students are the uh, sons and daughters of well-connected Chinese Communist Party officials, people they know will be loyal to the party that will take advantage of our most advanced labs and classrooms and then come back to China and employ that knowledge on behalf of the Chinese state. Hmm. Uh, I think we should get our students in India. Uh, we need a lot of foreign students because um, they're pretty smart. And they're or, or like I said, you should bring more Chinese students to the United States to study things like the Federalist Papers because China needs democracy more than they need artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think that's a good, you know, the way it works at Hillsdale, you teach some at Hillsdale, you know. Um, um, uh, we, nobody comes into class to represent a point of view. We're supposed to work together to figure out what the, the truth of the matter is. And that means if somebody wants to make the argument for Karl Marsh, good luck to him. <laughs> and and uh, that, would, that would be a healthy atmosphere. I'm going to get me some Chinese students, maybe. Um, now, in defense policy, are, you, you talked about urgent needs. Are we on track? Are we doing what we need to be doing to keep up, to keep ahead of them? We, we're on track, but we need to get moving faster down the track. Some of that's related to the virus itself. The defense industry, just like any industry, has been adversely affected by the pandemic. So you're going to see cost overruns and budget overruns for a lot of our defense contractors as a result of their factories having to shut down because of the spread of the virus. So the first and most immediate thing we have to do is make sure that we spend the money that offsets those overruns so we don't take it out of future budgets or just end up getting fewer ships, submarines, aircraft, and what have you. But we also need to accelerate the acquisition of the kind of systems that are going to offset China's advantage in the Western Pacific. Like I said, the kind of uh, intermediate range missiles uh, that we were prohibited from building under an obsolete treaty with the Soviet Union until just last year. Whereas China has thousands and thousands of missiles on its coast targeted Taiwan and our bases in South Korea and Japan and Guam. The kind of stealth aircraft that are going to be critical to offsetting Chinese power and the kinds of um, naval ships, uh, especially submarines, that are so critical to offsetting Chinese power. Uh, this has been a, a welcome development under the Trump administration to start reinvesting in the kinds of weapons that we need to deter a competitor like China, um, as opposed to continue to fight low-level insurgencies uh, against terrorists, which is still important, but China is the most critical and dangerous threat we face in the long run. Our military is moving in the right direction. We should be moving faster, though. I uh, am teaching a course on Churchill, which I often do, and uh, this time I learned something better than I've ever known it. Uh, I found a map and put it up of the British Empire, and then I colored in the parts that Churchill thought were most important. And almost all of the British Empire was along the coast of Eurasia. And, uh, and the parts that he didn't care about so much were the parts that were not on the coast. And uh, that's because great maritime power, not a very big country. And then if you look at a map of the world, the United States is, you know, the world's a lot smaller than it used to be because of technology. But 85% of the world's people live in Eurasia, Africa. And we are located in between the two coasts of that great landmass. And that means Navy and uh, air power and allies along the coast. Are our alliances along the coast of Eurasia strong? So our alliances are strong. Um, they need to be stronger and our focus needs to be first and foremost on that Asian littoral, especially in the Western Pacific where China is trying to build a foothold in which it can project power first in its region, then throughout Eurasia and then all around the world. Um, what you said about Churchill is well taken, thinking as he was from an island off the northern coast of Europe, 
You can apply that to America, though, as well. We're really just a continental-sized version of Great Britain when you think about geopolitics. And, and what you laid out is something that your old teacher, Bill Rood, would have laid out. He would have said that geography is the most fundamental aspect of geopolitics because it's the most eternal. It never changes. Um, and it's simply a fact that China has an advantageous geography to influence events throughout Asia, especially East and South Asia, and that's something that we have to work to deter, and that's why we are a great maritime and air power, even though so many of our wars have been fought over so many years on land, whether it in Iraq and Afghanistan, Vietnam, uh, World War II, World War I, and so forth. Um, ultimately, we had to fight to get in there to be able to, to conduct those wars on land. That means naval power, it means air power, that is also how we deter those wars from happening in the first place, which is, of course, of course, the most urgent matter of strategy is to stop wars from starting in the first place. Uh, do you think the people of America realize the role of China? I mean, let's talk about that one more second. Because when this thing started, we didn't have good information. And we continued not to get good information from the place where, where it started. Did that set us back in our reaction to the, to the virus? Is it costing us money? Is it uh, making it worse? Yeah, there's no doubt that China's lies and its disinformation in January, really even back to December, Larry, um, have made this outbreak much more severe than it had to be. In fact, there's some studies that suggest if China had just acted a week or two earlier, it could have reduced the number of cases worldwide by two-thirds or even up to 90%. That may seem a lot for just a week or two of inaction, but as we've seen, um, sometimes just a few days in some of our big cities or states in the United States have made a large difference. So if China had been open and transparent from the very beginning, if it had asked for help, help from the United States, from Japan, from the European Union in December to identify what was happening in Wuhan, this might have just been a local outbreak in Wuhan, not even Hubei province and certainly not all of mainland China, but rather it, it lied, it dissembled, it covered up, it tried to intimidate others. And as a result, we have a global pandemic that is going to lead to an economic contra contraction as severe as anything since the Great Depression. China's directly responsible for those actions. And, and I can assure you the American people understand that. China was not very popular with the American people before this pandemic. Now they view China as a pariah state. Mm. Good. Less so in Europe, probably? China, public opinion about China is trending in a very bad direction for Beijing all around the world. Maybe not as, oh, okay. maybe not as severe as it is uh, in the United States, but, uh, and again, this is popular opinion, not elite opinion, but popular opinion, not only in the United States, but in Europe, even in Africa, which is, has some of China's closest partners, um, public opinion is moving pretty rapidly away from China as it should. Okay. How long do you think it'll take us to get out of this mess? It's hard to say, Larry, because there's so many unknowns still about this virus. But I have to say that over the last month, our people have done a very good job of working hard to arrest the spread of the virus. And that's ultimately what it will take to get people back to work, back into their normal economic routines, to get the economy back on its feet, is to arrest the spread of the virus, to make people believe, rightly, that they're less likely to contract the virus, and critically, that will have a functioning healthcare system and hopefully very soon drugs that will help treat them. So they may get sick, but they won't die from this virus. Once they have the confidence to do that, we'll begin to get back to something like normal. And then obviously, as the president's task force said uh, a couple weeks ago, this is gonna be a rolling, gradual, calibrated set of decisions. What works for one region is not gonna work for another region. Obviously, New York City is the hardest hit region in the entire country. It's going to need its own special strategy. That's gonna be very different from what you see in Michigan or Arkansas. And in Arkansas, what Little, what's right for Little Rock may not be right for Pocahontas, may not be right for Dardanelle. Um, so this is gonna be a decision, set of decisions that are made by our governors and local officials as we begin to get people back uh, into the workplace, hopefully back to their normal routines still with taking precautions like wearing masks, not shaking hands, washing your hands, and so forth. Uh, but I do think that we're looking at a matter of weeks, not months, before we can begin to get back to something like normal with prudent precautions in most of the country. So Tom, that's great. And uh, I would say that uh, I would congratulate you on your courage here more warmly than I do. 
if I thought you cared much about the opinion of the Washington Post, but, <laughs> but I happen to know you don't. But uh, it is an insight that you've had here, and then a stubbornness rising to courage to keep talking about this when everybody wanted to talk about something else, and they were calling you a conspiracy theorist, and I think you're to be thanked for that. Well, thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. And uh, great to talk. And uh, I know our people who are watching this, there'll be many, are going to have enjoyed it, and uh, we'll do it again. Thank you, and thanks for hosting this very important symposium. Good. Take care.